Almost ready to start. And people tune in. Wish that video quality is a little better. And go off the pause. Getting some love, getting some likes. Rich, as always, tuning in, ready to watch and learn something new today. Got some music going, something classical. Keeping it classy up here. Jordan Fabian. Nice of you to jump in. Addison, thank you. I'm happy everything sounds good. Hope everyone's excited to learn a, a festive board game. I can't really call it a new board game, although it may be new to you guys. It's a historic board game, to put it easily. Alright. Dylan. Welcome to the view and my friend. Alright, it's about four o'clock. As you all know, it's time to get a rockin'. We're gonna open this up with a bit of history on what we got in front of us today, and then we're gonna get into how to play with what we got in front of us today. Uh, thank you for joining us, those of you who tuned in. Thank you for joining us with today's episode of Online Camp Classroom here with South Mountain YMCA Camps. Today's topic, today's item, today's fanciful thing is the Royal Game of Ur. That's spelled U R Ur. All right, and this is right here the Royal Game of Ur. This is a, a modern representation of it, a replica. Um, it's not an exact replica to what you would find in the museums, but it has all the right emblems, sizing, etc. So it's relatively accurate. The the original board that you would find in the uh, the British Museum of Natural History of History is smooth topped. This one has these wooden dowel ridges to give it some more texture and also to keep things straight in case someone were to bump the board I suppose. All right now uh, some history on the game of her because I love history. My mom the history teacher wouldn't let me live it down if I didn't bring up the history of it. 
All right, it has actually a very intriguing history. So the, the royal game of Ur, uh, or the game of 20 squares, it originates from ancient Mesopotamia and predates chess, backgammon, and all sorts of other old iconic games that we still play today. All right. Uh, it, you know, it dates back to the early third millennium BCE. All right. So put that in context or simply it, it comes from ancient Mesopotamia. All right. Which is modern day Iraq. All right. So it's, it originates from the Middle East. It's one of the oldest board games we know of. All right. Uh, the game uh, has been found to have been played as widespread as Crete and Sri Lanka and its height at its height the game was believed to hold spiritual significance capable of foretelling the player's future from its outcomes maybe we'll tell our future today a little bit all right um, the game of Ur held popularity well into late antiquity and is suggested to have been an early inspiration for several popular existing board games today um, after fading away into history, the game of Ur was rediscovered and received its known name from English archaeologist Sir Leonard Woolley during excavations of the Royal Cemetery at Ur between 1922 and 1934. So this, this board game, this game, disappeared for thousands of years into history and was only rediscovered in the last hundred years. All right. Uh, numerous representations of the board have been discovered across the Middle East with varying scale and size and layout. There's a version that, uh, you know, is missing this middle piece. And it's just all, you know, the bigger two sections together. Um, for a time, archaeologists and scholars only had assumptions of how the game was originally played. Uh, until British Museum curator Irving Finkel, personal hero of mine, uh, reconstructed the rules from a Babylonian clay tablet. All right, because he, he's a curator or assistant curator of uh, Mid Middle Eastern history and artifacts. And he is a leading, um, a leading study in ancient dialect, uh, ancient calligraphies and different speaks or written book speaks. Uh, for the object of the game, all right, so let's get into the actual game itself. The object of the game is it's a two-player game. Um, and how I have it kind of set up here with the camera, um, is how you would be facing the game. So if, if I was playing against you guys there at home, uh, this would be your view. All right. The game and the original game, something that I thought was really cool when I first ever heard about this game as a kid, is that the original board that they found at, in, at the old city state of Ur in the cemeteries had this feature, which was a built in drawer for all the pieces. All right, and so the pieces, as you can see, you have dice, all right, which uh, these are called knuckle die or a pyramid die, okay? There's a, there's a modern day version of this, which is just looked at, you know, by gamers, uh, tabletop gamers, as a, uh, a four-sided die, all right? The, uh, the pyramid die or the four-sided die is one of the old, oldest versions of rolling dice or knuckles that we can really look at in games, tabletop and board games. Uh, and you can see we have a collection of things and we'll get into the numbers and how many of everything you need later And you also notice that we have these white and black uh, Traditionally, they would be clay, but in our case, they're wooden markers for on the tabletop. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll pour these out over to the side Put our little drawer back in uh, Which the drawer is handy you can use that as where you roll your die or obviously just for storing things away All right, so we have a cool die now the game is played with four of these knuckles, these die, and you notice that on these four sided die, you have two corners that are black, like the rest of the main body, and you have two corners that have white on them. All right, so how these die work is when I roll them, if it lands with a white marker facing up, that counts as one. And if it lands with a black or non-painted marker facing up, that equals zero. And so you roll four die, so that every turn, every time you roll a die, you have a chance to move a marker up to four spaces, depending on how you roll. So there's a bit of chance involved in this game, all right? But you have four die in order to play 
uh, the basic version of Ur that we're going to be talking about today. There's two main uh, versions of Ur, one that's very basic, more straightforward for someone who's beginning and learning, and then there's a more complicated version of Ur uh, that goes a lot more in depth with how the board works and uh, the pathway that you have to follow. Okay, so you have your four die, and then like I said, you have your markers, all right, and you'll notice on the markers, you know, there's white and black ones, everyone starts with the same number of markers, and on one side they have five dots, and the other side there are no dots. Now some people think that the five dots stand for fluidity, constant motion, because this is a racing and attacking game, all right? Uh, and some people think, oh, that's just a cool pattern that they like. You'll notice that on the board itself, there are a number of emblems that have the five dot in it, or multiple dots, throughout the patterns. And again, most of those special symbols, aside from looking really cool and eclectic, um, are only used in the advanced or the, the, the trickier version of the game. Okay, But each side starts with seven markers. All right, now I'll go ahead and lay those out. So we got one for each. We got our markers for the white side. We got our markers for the black side. All right, now the basic form of this game, it is a turn-based game back and forth. All right, uh, pit, pitch between the white and the black side, similar to chess. All right. And how this works out, in the, the basic version of this game, which there's actually a really awesome video of uh, Dr. Irvin Finkel playing this game and demonstrating and talking more in depth on the history of the game of Ur and sort of his story of discovering it. Because uh, the reason Dr. Irvin Finkel is so, um, is kind of a big figure in the game of Ur is because in his, uh, in his department at the Museum of Natural, uh, Natural History in London, uh, they actually have the original, the first found discovered board that was discovered by uh, discovered by Woolley, as well as they have the original stone tablets that were discovered that had the rules that explained how to play the game in it. Um, and obviously they're in Mesopotamia; they're not written in English, <laughs> you know, because they're, they're old as can be. Um, but he actually had the opportunity to translate those and figure out how to actually play the game of Ur. All right, so how it works is you have two people against each other, like I said, and the idea is you have to onboard your pieces one at a time, turn by turn, and you start here in this corner. All right, so from my side of the board, I would start here. From that side of the board or your side of the board, you would start here. All right, and your pathway in the basic form is to follow up here, turn, Make another turn, go straight down the center, turn, and I'm trying to come back to this emblem here, okay? Whereas the your side, you're trying to onboard here, make your way up, turn, come down the center, turn, back out, and land here, and then exit off the board. All right, now we would roll to the side who goes first, and each would take a turn going back and forth, all right? Now, on your turn, there are multiple squares. Now, for the more complicated, more in-depth version of this game, all the squares have, just about all the squares have a purpose or a meaning. Uh, for the basic, we only really focus on these rosettes. All right, you'll notice there are five rosettes, five dots, five rosettes, five of them. Are There's a lot of fives going on. Mesopotamians said something for the number five. All right, now, if my piece is to, were to land on the rosette, I would get to roll again and potentially move that or another piece. All right. When I roll, whenever I roll, if I'm able to move a piece, I must move a piece. If I'm unable to move a piece for whatever reason, I just lose my turn. Okay. In order to onboard a piece, I cannot have another piece in its way. And we'll talk about that a little more as we get into it. But when I want to offboard a piece mm -hmm. into, we'll call that the goal or the finishing area, which is this opening here for you and this one for me, all right? I have to have the exact, so if I have a piece sitting right here and I'm trying to get him into the goal, into the, you know, into the home front, all right? Into, to make the point, I need to roll a two or a one. I could roll a one, maybe land right here in this rosette. I get another roll out of it. 
where I roll a two, I can boop, boop, one, two, done. And that piece is secured. Because the goal of the game is to get all seven of your pieces secured into safety. So I want to play a couple of mock turns to show you um, how this game would kind of play out. All right, so obviously, like I said, we have our four die. All right, I'm going to scoot the board back a little bit, just a pinch, because I want to go out of, out of view for you guys, because I want to be able to roll where you guys can see it. All right, now, like I said, traditionally, you would roll, see who got the highest roll to see who would go first. And typically, whoever goes first, we get to pick which color they got to play with. All right, because there's no real dictation to which side is supposed to be which color, or no designation. Uh, like there would be in chess. And for those of you who have seen my chess videos in the past, um, yeah, we, we went into a little depth on that. All right, so I got my four knuckles. I'm gonna roll. Let's see, we got a two. And since I'm on this side, and let's say I got to go first, I'm gonna take one of my black markers. I'm gonna move in one, two. All right, so I'm set, I got, I'm on the board, all right? Now we want to move the white on the board. Okay, so white's got to roll. I'll roll for you. Don't worry. I got your back. Roll. White got a three. All right, because we got one, two, and three. Again, you know that it counts for a move because of that white indicator pointing up. This is the black indicator pointing up. It means no move. So we get three. Remember, we're on boarding here. Two, three. Okay. We're going to go again for the black. Four. Woo. All right. So I got two choices here. This is where it gets interesting. Now, I could move this guy forward four. One, two, three, four. And that puts him in the main center lane, which is a dangerous move because in this main center lane, all right, if I have a piece in this main center lane and my opponent is able to move a piece into the same box, they bump my piece out back to the beginning. All right. Which is a major setback. Or... I don't have to move that piece forward. What I could also do, because I have pieces in reserve waiting to get on the board, I can take another piece and go one, two, three, four. And what happens when we land on the rosette? We get another roll. All right. So we get it on the rosette. I got another roll. This is a champion move. And I get a one. Okay. So I got two choices. I can move what this guy up into uh, the danger zone, as we'll call it. I can move this guy up or I could board, I could onboard another piece. And I think strategically, I'm gonna look to onboard another piece. Because in the game of Ur, you kinda wanna be behind and set yourself up to get a jump. And what that means is if I'm ahead of your pieces, it's hard for me to take them. I can't bump you off the board that way if a majority of my pieces are ahead. And I'm more of on the defensive. Whereas I prefer personally as a player in this game, in the game of Ur, I prefer to be on the offensive. I want to be, I want to be pushing the tempo. I want to be in control. All right, so that was my turn for black. Let's see what white can do. All right, so white got a two. So white's got two options. They can again, they can bump up here and, and start making their way down the channel, or they can onboard a piece. I think we're gonna onboard a piece. One, two. We got two pieces on the board. Goes back to black. Ooh, we got one. Well, I can't onboard because I have a piece here at my onboarding starting square. So I have to move either move this guy up one or this guy up one. Again, I, I don't want to get set up, so I'm going to move. All right, so let's see what white will do. They got one. Strategic strategy here. Now, white could onboard a piece into this opening square. Or we can move a piece up to the rosette. I personally, I think we should move up to the rosette and get a second roll. Now, this is a gamble, though. This is a gamble, though, because right now, I have two pieces on board for white. I'm getting a second roll, but what if I roll a zero? What if I roll nothing? The knuckles say no. Ah, we were lucky. We got two. So just for uh, argument's sake and production value here, we're going to go ahead and move this guy up, too. We're going to see what happens. All right, we'll see if black gets lucky and can make a bump move. All right. Two. <gasps> they do. So now, what black can do, because I can't move this guy up here, I could onboard a piece. One, two, because I got a two. Or I can take this guy in the square and do a one, two, and bump that guy right out. 
All right, putting me at the advantage. I'm technically in the lead here. My only worries here is if white gets a four, they can do a bump. To get, you know, so we got to watch out and see where things go. And we would keep going through that process over and over again until we were able to get our pieces near the end. So we're going to fast forward the game. We're going to get up a little bit. I remember I said black goes to goes this way, come back around to get to the offload. White, we'll give white one or two more pieces. White needs to go back towards them. All right, so we'll assume we fast forward to the game here. We're going to assume it's black's turn. All right. Black got a three. All right. One, two, three. Again, using those rosettes, because remember, those rosettes, there's five of them on the board. They're spread out really nice. We're going to use the, that rosette to our advantage um, for two reasons. One, that guy's now in safety. White doesn't come around this way. It has to go its own way. All right. I get another roll. I got two pieces in the safe house. Not a bad day. The only negative is now my safe house is clogged up. So hopefully with this roll, we got a one. So we get one off the board into safety. So that make, that puts black at one point. White is still at zero, trying to catch up. All right, we'll do a couple more rolls here. All right, what do we get? All right, we got a two off of white. Again, tactical advantage. We could either two to get another roll, two to get another roll. I think we're gonna do two to get another roll. Keep that guy in reserve. And you get better at picking up these little triangle die, these knuckles. It, it's tough. All right, we got a three. All right, what should white do? Oh, well, I think white should do this. One, two, three. We got someone in the safe house ready to off board. Not a bad move. Again, the focus of the game, there's two fronts of it. You got to think strategy for down the center. You got to think, um, you know, offensively and defensively on that strategy. Because you don't want to get too ahead because you don't want to be stuck on the on the defense. And you don't want to get too far behind because you want to be able to launch a successful offense. All right? So there's strong strategy mixed in with this game of chance. All right? And it goes and goes and goes again until you get all of your pieces on the board, shifted through, and off-boarded to safety, whichever designated side that might be. Pretty straightforward. Not too bad. But now, we're going to go ahead and clean off the board. Let's talk about the slightly more advanced version, okay? And what I highly suggest, this is a game that's fun for you. You know, there's, you can find online templates uh, to print out and make your own board. Just a basic two-dimensional paper board, pieces cut out. And you can use three-sided die if you have any around the house. Or you can even use uh, paper cutouts to make three-sided die. Or come up with your own system uh, to roll your, your, your spots. Maybe you take a, a single six-sided die, you roll it, but five and six don't count for anything. That way you only have the possibility for four. So five and six are automatically zeros. There's a lot of ways you could do it. Um, when you're playing, all right, in the more complicated form of this, the the pathway changes. So originally, remember, if I would start on your side of the board, I'm starting here and moving my way, turning, going down the center, turning back, coming around to off board into safety, right? To make my points, right? In the more complicated way where things get a little feistier, there's two big changes. One, the pathway changes where the pathway now, you come on board at the same spot, come up, turn, come back, turn, circle around, come back, and then you off board here, okay? The other big change, and I'll explain why here soon, is the pieces all start flipped over to their blank sides okay now why is this well let me tell you why all right so they start on their blank sides because as you proceed and progress around you'll notice these wonderful spaces here okay so these spaces only when your piece land if your piece lands or passes over these then all right, only if your piece lands on these, then you're able to flip your blank to a four dot to a five dot side and progress through. And preferably that way, if you're close or it comes down to a possible tie, which is very, very tricky to do, 
you go by who got the most not only markers across the finish line, so to speak, but also who got the most flipped markers over the finish line. The other big thing is you'll notice, I found this very intriguing the first time we got pointed out to me, you'll notice these squares, all right, which are just the single dots of the eyes, all right? So a feature you can do in the more advanced game is I can stack up to four length-sided pieces on those. As well, as long as I have stacked pieces, they are safe. So say those guys were actually over here and white was coming down the line and he rolls a three. One, two, three. He can't make that move and he can't knock any of those pieces. They are locked in and safe, but I can only put up to four there. I have to have at least two to make it a safe square. Notice that that emblem appears again five times. All right. But if my pieces are flipped to the five dot side, all right, after crossing over these transition squares, the only safe spot I can do that on is the five dot with the five circle with the circles around them. All right. When I get back to those. Now, these advanced rules, and many like them because there are a lot of versions of the, the advanced rules. All right, the advanced rules come from two sources. One is just um, back and forth from uh, different, different facts they found about the game, as well as that period of time where they didn't quite understand how the game was played until uh, it was translated from the Mesopotamia tab, from the tablets that were found. Uh, that had the actual rules of the game on them. All right. So uh, from both those sources, we've kind of come up and collaborated over the years to make this more advanced version of the game. Um, some other advanced rules that get added sometimes is some people, uh, you know, and this comes from some of the traditional or the, the ancient text, is, you know, different ways to use the game for betting, uh, for fortune telling. Um, for deciding things or just adding new elements of difficulty. Um, and that's why with this particular set, we have additional pieces and die that came in with it. Uh, some people would maybe to, to change, the, change the difficulty of the game, they'll add pieces. So you maybe start out with, uh, instead of just your seven pieces, you start with 11 pieces or 10 pieces or whatever it might be, whatever makes the most sense at the time or what you're interested in just to change up the game and the variable. And maybe everyone wants to start with their own set of four die or maybe it's just good to have some spare die to have. But there's different variations you can explore and get into that are very intriguing uh, and can make it very challenging uh, depending on how often you play, how into the game you really get or are. Uh, but it's a really cool game. Um, a fun thing to explore on your time at home or when you're hanging out with the family. Very portable. Uh, like I said, all of this, one of the niftiest parts of this entire game is the hidden drawer. Um, and the fact, the fact that the original discovered board from the city of Ur had this, like this was part of it, um, is fascinating to me. Like talk about, talk about clever and amazing design. All right, and there's all sorts of interesting history that goes behind the board in general, just with its, you know, the game's age, and also, uh, you know, the back and forth. There's constant debate uh, that you can find in articles online of, you know, the true meaning and representation, and if it had more purpose and meaning to them than just a, a fun game to gather around and play on or bet on. Um, but overall, in the end of the day, if you ask me. It's just a fun game to, you know, spend some time with a friend and uh, enjoy. So with that all being said, you know, again, you know, if you're interested in playing the game of Ur uh, with your friends and family, go online. There's lots of templates that you can print out, um, lots of images that you can source from, make your own board, um, maybe get really creative with a little bit of woodworking if, if that's something that's up your alley. Um, and then, you know, all the pieces you can, you know, whether you, you can either fabricate yourself. Uh, so I've seen some people use rocks or marbles um, or just cut out pieces of paper or even chess pieces. Uh, you know, you could use 
there's enough pawns on a chessboard, you could play this with pawns. All right. And, uh, you know, just explore it and see what you like. And hope everybody enjoyed it. If, you know, after seeing this video, you decide, you know, that's a really cool game. I'm going to make my own board. Send us here at camp. Send us pictures of it. We'd love to see what you guys come up with. Um, it's always cool to get feedback. And, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, if you're watching this as a replay on YouTube, you know, make sure you like and subscribe. Uh, and, you know, check out our website for other videos and other topics and content as well. Uh, you know, down in the description below, hopefully you'll see a link. Uh, you know, if you have anything to give, you know, you know, please, you know, donate whatever you can uh, to South Mountain YMCA camps. Helping send kids to camp or doing, you know, emergency relief fund. So, I hope everyone's healthy and happy and that you guys have a wonderful rest of the day. Okay.